Hello, and welcome to the Marketing in the Raw podcast. My name's Adam Helway, and I'm so glad that you joined me. Uh, This is the place where we talk about all things related to digital marketing, demand generation, so on and so forth. But we also talk a lot about things that have an impact on customer behavior, expectations, and experiences. And today is one of those episodes where we're going to be geeking out a little bit and talking about um, technology and and technology that is going to have a significant impact on the way that your customers uh, interact with content, interface with each other, uh, and do lots of other things. And I am talking with Irina Cronin. She is the CEO of a company called Infinite Retina, and she also just released a new book book by the same name. The topic we're going to talk about here is spatial computing. Now, I know, I know the words, the the terms, you know, but just hear me out. You've got to listen to this. I mean, don't, don't you remember watching that movie Back to the Future? I mean, I don't know how old you are, but like, it's one of my favorite movies. And in Back to the Future uh, 2, uh, Marty had a uh, pair of self-lacing Nike shoes. Okay. You just push a button and they, and they self laced around his, his, his feet. And then he also had the most awesome thing that for decades we all wanted, which was the hoverboard. Okay. Now look, Nike's made the shoes and you could go out and get them. I think they're only like $40,000 or something like that. Right. And there's a lot of people that have been playing around trying to create hoverboards and things like that. But what we're talking about here arguably is so much cooler considering, especially for marketers, it's so much cooler. So I, I really want you to enjoy this interview. Um, I want, and towards the end of the interview, I asked if there was anything in the process of, of writing the book that she did uh, that stood out to her. It was sort of an epiphany or a surprise or anything, considering how long Irina has been already working in this space. And uh, I want you to listen to the answer she gave me because it surprised me and it was a good one. Okay, so go on. Enjoy, learn about spatial computing, and if you already love that sort of stuff, then geek out like I did with this interview with Irina Cronin. So, Irina, you've been active in a lot of different disruptive technology spaces. Um, AR, which is not completely brand new, obviously, and robotics and AI and autonomous driving and all that stuff. So that's interested you for a while, what's, what's drawn you to these spaces? What is it that interests you that keeps you doing work in that space uh, even till now? It has to do with improvement uh, of what currently exists. So I'm always captivated by something that seems so obvious to me uh, that it could really change things for the better, you know, whether it's getting better data and then figuring out what to do with that so that lives are, are changed to the better. Um, having new technologies like whole vehicles, uh, is a new technology autonomous um, that could really solve a lot of issues, um, make people's lives easier. Uh, so it's like, I don't know, I've always been like that. I, I've looked ahead. I mean, back in 98, I was thinking of having films, being able to download a film in a park and watch it in the park. And all my friends called me crazy. And uh, it's hot, you know, you could do that now. So um, it's like, I see something I like, I'm a P I have an appeal towards um, both for entertainment and usefulness. I think the usefulness is going to catch most people. Uh, It's that productivity uh, increase. It's that major corporations see that there's a need for it and it gets used. That really gets me excited. So uh, all these things, um, what I include in spatial computing, which is every kind of technology that you would need for moving through a three-dimensional world. So that's AR, VR, uh, sensors, um, AI, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. I think is just natural to human being. People want to see things as realistically as possible. And if you can replicate that 
in all kinds of different digital situations, I think that's a positive. So that's what it feels to me. So you are now the CEO of Infinite Retina, and we'll talk about your book uh, by the same name in, in, in just a little bit. And so you've, you've doubled down uh, on, on, on one space in particular at the moment. Um, you, you guys at Infinite Retina work with and, and, and talk with companies and consult on spatial computing. And I want to dig into that a, a bit more. Can you explain to folks what spatial computing is and why are companies like Apple and Facebook and Tesla and, and others uh, that we haven't even heard of. And I know that you guys have talked to a lot of folks. Why are they heavily investing their time and energy into it? Uh, great question. I, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to bunch many technologies into spatial computing under that umbrella for the reason that those technologies can all be used to, for a human being virtual being or a robot to be able to move through 3D space. So, um, and, and the commonalities are there. Um, you can't just talk about AR because AR uh, in the future, and even now are using aspects of machine learning, but in the future is gonna use it extremely heavily. Autonomous vehicles are using camera, sensor technology, AI, all that stuff that's spatial to be able to figure out where the car is. Um, you've got uh, also uh, Sebastian Thrun is working on flying cars, EVTOLs that uses the same kind of technology in terms of sensing what the environment is about. Um, VR obviously uses sensors. Um, uh, AI is being used now in experiences for entertainment, but will be heavily used for more uh, useful and practical things in the future. So all of these things kind of combine these technologies into uh, the idea of, you know, how do we actually get to move through a three-dimensional world? So, um, yeah. And, and, and I, and I know you, you work with Robert Scoble and Robert and I both, uh, we, we love our Tesla model threes. Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> and, and, and so just, just as an, as an example, um, how how it's already being applied, how spatial computing is already being applied, which is, is it's being applied in a lot of different ways, like you said, both in on the business side and uh, on on the consumer side. But just as an example, right? There's there's so much technology in a in a Tesla vehicle to allow it to do um, a, a lot of things, but the the fun stuff of not having to worry about traffic for instance and do the autonomous oh, driving yeah. on long mm -hmm. trips i know i know robert tested that quite a bit going on a trip all across the entire us in his model 3 when he first got it um but that's that's one of my favorite examples of something that's already in consumers hands that's definitely um leveraging spatial computing um yeah so well let me just give you another uh, quick example so everyone knows pokemon go and antic right so um they're working on a headset now with Qualcomm to be able to leverage the new kinds of software that they've been building. They couldn't find a hardware company that would be able to take advantage of the things that they wanted to do. So that's why they have to partner uh, for this AR headset. Um, their software heavily uses obviously spatial because just like the autonomous car knows where where you are in your location um it it can track where you are it remembers where you are it sees what's around you it takes advantage of that by uh for neantic software placing things that are uh virtual that you can enjoy and, and play around with it knows where your friends are and how to utilize that. And with their new software, they're able to uh, actually put in tens of thousands of people to be able to play a game together. So it's that kind of um, expressiveness that you, you can have with the new kinds of spatial computing technologies that combines both the AI and the censoring and AI cloud, AR clouds and AR, all of that together that brings in new kinds of ways of doing things. So that's interesting to me because, um, and I'm a person who's played Pokemon Go and, 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 and obviously that's all being run off of 
our, our our mobile devices that we all have and and you've used the word sensor right so these yeah. devices have all kinds of sensors and have had them for a while and continued uh, to to uh, sort of innovate on them. Apple has done so with their, uh, I don't even know if it's called an M1 chip anymore. It's an M something chip these days, but a mm-hmm. completely separate processor to process all of that motion data, knowing that they were moving in this direction towards more and more sophisticated spatial computing. But what you were describing is a company, Niantic, that is a pioneer in that space for the sake of you know consumer software uh, apps on on mobile devices because they've they've had Pokemon Go they've also done a Harry Potter property they did um, uh, what did, what was the name of the original one that they did uh, that was primarily it was it was done with Google but it was a very similar um, uh, concept that actually spawned the 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 Pokemon side of things um, but what you're saying is like these guys as the pioneers had a broader vision for what could be done and currently ingress. the, the yeah. ingress that's right yeah. and currently currently the hardware that was available could not help them oh, manifest yeah. that vision yeah. yeah so um i mean this 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 is this is nothing new uh in terms of pushing the boundaries so but you only hear about it internally if you're an employee in the company and usually when you're on the project. So things like this don't go past those boundaries. But it, it right now in in spatial computing, and let's let's take AR for an example, there are tens of companies, I'm not gonna say a hundred because I know that's not true. So there's tens of major AR sets that are being made uh, or being created, not only being spec, but are actively being created right now. Um, that will be out within the next two to three years. So it's not only Apple that is working on um, two or so headsets and and Qualcomm and a whole bunch of other companies are doing it. So there's going to be a lot of competition in that space very soon. And along with the hardware, there's a lot of software that needs to get built that's pushing those boundaries. You know, there's there's been problems with battery, uh, with the, the materials getting too hot, um, uh, people can't stay in the, the particular headset that they've made for too long. Um, you know, so many different issues that they have to test over and over again, change materials, all that kind of stuff that eats uh, time and money away. I mean, just look at what happened to Magic Leap, right? There's yeah. lots of reasons why that went down, but yeah. the money went into testing. So, um, there are a lot of things happening that most people, even technologists, don't know about because it's happening behind closed doors. But lots of new things will be uh, uh, arriving within the next two or three years in the AR heads in the AR space. So I'm glad you brought up AR because you know folks for so many years spoke of, of VR and that has manifested itself in so many kind of rudimentary ways and then ultimately into sort of the the the, the cardboard uh, style stuff and and um, some of the other really basic headsets that don't have a lot of you know freedom of motion or or controls for sort of the consumer side of things um, and, and now AR is uh is has been talked about a lot and really has manifested itself in a number of different ways between sort of apple's ar kit and that sort of thing on on the the user side and you talked about niantic and all that um through kind of through the productivity side of things we've got microsoft hololens that's been just developing and developing developing for a long long time and i'm probably missing a number of sort of the big players that have um been actively um showing off some of what they're doing or showing peaks into what they're doing with um, all the stuff going on. I mean, even Apple, for instance, released uh, a, a new iPad pro with a LIDAR camera on it. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, and that's yep. having that, that's starting to creep its way as a person who's watched Apple for, for uh, over a decade now. Um, it's interesting always to see Apple test out these little things on one device or another uh, to eventually a year, two years, three years from then, make it a a major um, uh, a, a cornerstone or, or or piece of their of their innovation across multiple pieces of technology. I'm actually quite surprised that that lidar doesn't end up making its way onto the next iPhone coming out fairly soon as well. Again, as sort of a 
dipping their toe into the water and seeing what data they can get back before they release their their broader real AR product. Um, but um, we've talked about some things that are on the side of the fence for the average consumer and yeah. And we've talked about some of the things that are on the sort of business side. Which of those sides do you think are, are going to be the biggest driver of making this, uh, making making AR in particular, hmm. um, a, a, a real day to day thing for people? Okay, so I'm a, a, a huge believer in practical use uh, being the motivator for people to even notice AR. So um, I think it might take until Apple enters the market with their headset in about two years for this more widespread use to actually happen. Um, Obviously the Apple name and brand uh, is really huge with people and that will initially uh, prick people's ears up to this actually being a product. So um, just by virtue that it's Apple will bring the average regular consumer who's not even into tech interested in uh, a new headset, a new AR headset that they would offer. And then beyond that, so that's the initial first kick of interest. um, I think you have to offer people something that really changes their lives, uh, not in, it doesn't have to be in an extremely significant way. It could be something as easy as, you know, um, uh, giving you information in an easier way than if you had to look at your phone or a computer. So if it uses voice, which it will, um, you could easily get information that way uh, on your head. It's gonna be light, it's gonna be good looking. Um, So even really simple informational apps Uh, available on an Apple headset, I think will enable millions of people to want to have it. Yeah. And Apple has always been in that interesting position, right? When (laughs) early on um, we had digital music options when it came to devices, they, they, they weren't really necessarily great, but they were there. And then, and then came the, the iPod and uh, we had, mobile devices as well and then came the iphone and um and when apple ends up introducing elements into their ecosystem or just into their devices alone through software updates or the latest you know greatest uh uh, phone that they have um they seem to really kind of propel the entire market it seems because now uh, folks who are um, are purchasing those devices not as necessarily only productivity tools, but in many cases, like it's 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 their sole computing device or it's their yeah. own personal thing that they're using on a day to day. There, it's it's in its fashion and lifestyle in many cases as well. They go and they grab that device, uh, and and it, uh, it it it's an important part of uh, or, or one of the most important. Uh, uh, possessions they have. I mean, you've heard, yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard Warren Buffett talk about how, mm-hmm. you know, one of the reasons he's so bullish on, on, on Apple, it, it, you know, is because he, he could go ahead and sell his personal jet and he could pay somebody else to fly, but he couldn't get rid of his iPhone without feeling like he was missing. <laughs> out on, right. Uh, yeah. But, but, but in this, but in this case, what you're talking about is when that change happens on that front, it's, it's likely going to, kick in behaviors and expectations um, that are going to bleed into the other, 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 other industries, maybe on the consumer side, but, but probably also on the, on the business side as well, similar to where the iPhone, it took a while for businesses to go ahead and drop their blueberries and end up adopting (laughs) the iPhones. But I I remember there was a number of years there where, Apple was trying to make inroads into into the enterprise. I think Cisco was probably one of the first places that it was just trying to get it into the hands of of this company and add all of the features so that enterprise companies w- would find it acceptable security wise and yes. and all that sort of thing. So that's part of what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So the the enterprise market is very interesting. So as you know, um, Microsoft currently has the Hololens two. And we'll be iterating a new product soon for for AR for their AR headset. Um, and they obviously uh, push more towards enterprise. I mean, that's always been Microsoft's way, right? Um, Apple obviously has another entry point into their market. 
Uh, but I think all of this is going to converge, as you were saying. So just like the uh, computer and then personal computer, um, if it's useful uh, and practical and easy to use and um, uh, doesn't fail, you know, just like a light turning on a switch, a light switch, when you turn it on, it works, should work 100% of the time the way that it should work. Um, if the product is to finely tuned as that, um, it's going to have mass uses uh, for both consumer and enterprise. So uh, a lot of people don't know that AR is being used in enterprises right now, actually quite a bit. It's obviously not sexy. And, you know, it doesn't make media because it's ultra practical. But uh, even going back to like 2008, there has been certain aspects of AR, although not fully three dimensional, that have been, that have been used in logistics and manufacturing. Now, clearly logistics is a, a, a big place where AR is really useful, where if you're wearing a pair of glasses and there's information overlaying on top of it, as, long, as well as voice and recordings and all that kind of stuff that you could use is really helpful to somebody who needs to find an object amid all kinds of, you know, literally thousands of pallets and they need to find one object or one pallet. So um, this has been used, AR is being used now and will be used even more often for logistics. Um, it's gotten much better. The voice technology really works now. Um, more kinds of video conferencing can be done with a lot more people than ever before. The headsets in terms of FOV have gotten better, although you don't need uh, really high FOV for logistics because you And just, need, just share what FOV is for, for folks. Oh, sure. Field of view. So, um, so basically, uh, just to be really sim uh, simple about it, it it's how, let's say you have this um, virtual object in front of you. How big does this thing appear uh, to you? Uh, does it fill the whole uh, lens of the glasses that you have? Or does it fill a third of the size of it? And right now, uh, a lot of the head for enterprise, it fills a third or less for a very good reason, because the person behind those glasses has to have uh, ability to see other things for safety reasons much better. Um, but you, probably the FOV for consumer is going to be awesome, you know. Uh, but then again, there's going to be safety there too. So let's say uh, walking down the street, you want to be able to uh, limit that FOV or, or you know, turn it off even, turn on and off the capability of being able to get visuals as you're walking down the street, right? I mean, you even have car manufacturers that are thinking about uh, what these glasses will mean for when you're driving. This is prior to everything being autonomous, obviously. Um, yeah. To be able to use uh, for directions and all that kind of stuff. So that there again, you need to have the capability of, making that rectangle bigger or smaller as you need it to be. But um, yeah, so just let me, let me just add a little bit more about the enterprise. So it's not only logistics, it's manufacturing, they're using it, um, augmented reality uh, uh, paired with robots that they're calling cobots. And huh. it, yeah, it's really cool <laughs> when you see it. Um, so uh, they're more efficiently making things they're much more efficiently uh, fixing uh, machinery and other things that break down uh, because the, the person who would be for uh, would need to have much, uh, many classes and carry around lots of, you know, books to be able to see what the parts are, et cetera. It's now uh, on a piece of software in front of your, in front of your eyes and you could fix things much quicker. Uh, so it's stuff like this. And then retail, obviously, uh, is using um, AR, uh, not only uh, for the consumer, but inside companies that includes logistics as well. Uh, we, we cover transportation with uh, autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles. So um, there are actually seven different industry verticals that Robert and I uh, focused on in our book, The Infinite Retina, which just came out. 
Uh, and in all of these industry verticals, actually, AR is useful. Transportation, technology, media and telecommunications, that's a TMT vertical. Manufacturing, retail, healthcare, finance, and education. And, and what, because I, I, I'm thinking of the, the brain of the folks listening to this going, okay, this sounds like it's not going to necessarily uh, apply to me anytime soon, or, or maybe it's something that's a little, uh, you know, always with new tech, uh, there, there's, there's folks that just think like, how much tech is too much tech? Uh, what, 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 you know, how cutting edge do I need, do I need a smartphone? I have a regular phone. Do I need to use email? I have, you know, this and that and so on and so forth. Um, or this may, may be for the folks that are really like embracing the tech, but not necessarily for, for a lot of the other folks. I mean, what, how far are we out from, do you think from seeing a lot of this, um, come to fruition. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned the Apple iPhone and that sort of thing. And I think some of the limitations that even Apple will end up having also has to do with uh, adoptions of, of, of certain technologies that are sort of beyond what they're rolling out. So for instance, 5G uh -huh. um, wow. and, and, and how, what, what does 5G and some of those other elements, uh, what role do they play in making this a reality and roughly how far are we uh, maybe to having, I guess, what would be the, AR in public infrastructure mm -hmm. that needs to be created to, to support this for being in your car and using it while you're walking down the street and doing things maybe at work wow. as well. That's a fantastic question because um, there is such a great opportunity for entrepreneurs to set up new companies that have to deal with this infrastructure, which is coming. Um, all kinds of things, you know, whether, whether you're talking about um, having, uh, being able to navigate who owns what of the, of the space, the virtual space, uh, probably the virtual space is going to be caught up just like the internet in terms of ownership of particular virtual areas. So, um, if that's the case, there's all kinds of different businesses that will come in to try to claim that. And then other companies that will have to figure out the systems that would run that. Um, and then, you know, who, how does this get figured out? It's just a huge uh, undertaking. Um, so I, I think in terms of that happening, it is gonna start when Apple comes out with the glasses. And then I'd say somewhere between three and five years, you're gonna start seeing companies coming in with all kinds of novel uh, kinds of software and systems uh, to back up what's happening in AR. Um, and obviously government is going to come in, you know, to try to, to restrict or regulate what's going on there because we're talking about a new space, just like airspace is for, you know, telephone companies and, and, and that kind of thing. They're going to try to regulate that as well. Um, I think for regular everyday people, uh, for AR, just like I said, uh, if the app is useful, practical, uh, and the, the simpler it is, but the more likes that it has in terms of usefulness, it will penetrate uh, the market, the consumer market, really, really well. And that's all you need to do. And then it just builds from that really, really simple app. I mean, if you go all the way back in time to like when there was uh, an app called Physical. Uh, before Excel, many people think that this uh, application was uh, basically the breaker for people using digital apps because it was useful. Um, it was like using a calculator, but you have a computer uh, that you can, can do it on, on your um, mini computer that could do it on your, on your computer. Um, and then, of course, uh, there were other apps that came in after physical and then Excel won that game, right? Um, so I think Apple with a really, really simple AR app is going to be the breaker for this. And then all kinds of complexity will come in, but it'll be useful complexity for people. And in terms of uh, adapting uh, those AR headsets and what could be done for it, I think maybe uh, three or four years from now, 
that will happen. As you're saying, finding that that sort of killer app that makes people uh, want it and find that utility, not just entertainment yeah. value in in that application, um, is is very very interesting. That happened a lot, right? When when the when the Apple uh, store, the ecosystem sort of opened up to having third party developers uh, develop those apps. And one of the things that um, th that Apple does really smartly, and I think more um, uh, of these large uh, companies, most of the consumer companies that are also working in the business side, even Microsoft um, to some extent and, and, and Google and, and Samsung uh, have, have started to take note over the last few years is that Apple almost never comes to the party announcing um, something like this without having already created relationships with content creators uh, or app creators um, and sort of seeding the initial launch with some big cornerstone uh, applications that it believes will be entertaining, but also find sort of usefulness and maybe some whimsy uh, all together so that as soon as you get it, the momentum is already started uh, right exactly. from the get go. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a buzz about it. I mean, there's just been a buzz about it. There's a buzz about it now. <laughs> you know, this, this thing, actually the AR uh, Apple headset has been talked about even going back like three years ago. You know, so it's like people really want it. It's not only the heavy duty uh, tech people, but everyday people are like, I want to see it. I want to see what this looks like. You know, it's going to look like a pair of glasses that are like looking and that aren't heavy. And if that's the case, tons of people are going to buy that. Uh, but it's not only Apple. Let me just mention, so obviously Apple is going to, uh, just like the iPhone versus Android, you know, companies, right? Um, Apple's just going to begin it. Uh, they're probably going to be the forerunner just by way of their brand, right? Um, but lots of different companies are going to come in and be able to leverage uh, because of Apple. And it's going to become a real industry. Right now, to me, AR is something that is almost inevitable but it's not completely a real industry yet until Apple comes out with those, with the headset. Uh, it has a ton of promise. I know what the usefulness is, but it needs that push to be able to, to make it through. So as we, as we sort of get close to wrapping up here, I mean, it leads me to your, to your book. I want to make sure that I share that with folks. Um, yes. the, the book is called the infinite retina. Congratulations. Cause you literally, as of this recording, it's been two days since I think it, it's been uh, it's been available, not just to pre-order, but now to to get. I I pre-ordered mine, so I assume it's coming here any day now. Yes. Um, but the Infinite Retina: Spatial Computing, Augmented Reality, and how uh, how a collision of new technologies are bringing about the next tech revolution. And um, as I was saying before, you've been in the space for quite some time. I'm really interested to know, like in the process of writing this book um was there was there anything that you learned any like big surprises uh any epiphanies or revelations that just because you've now you now went on in this specific journey in this direction with the book and you've interviewed some folks throughout the book as well and and really um sort of synthesized it down to some really good concepts like you were talking about the different industries that get affected and so on like did you have anything that just sort of surprised you or was a little bit of a revelation even though you've been in this space for a while uh i wouldn't say exactly surprised but really validated what i had known inherently by being in this space for a while, how many thousands of people are actually working in this industry? Thousands and thousands and adding, even with COVID, they're hiring. Uh, uh, it's just amazing how many different areas are being uh, looked at uh, with the engineers and the different kinds of both hardware and software. Uh, what astounded me was how deep um, AR was actually being used in enterprises already. So I kind of knew that, but in talking with these people and specifically talking about how their companies are utilizing it, it became really clear that um, with enterprises, 
AR is already there for, for that kind of work. Um, that you don't have to sell a company to use AR for all of those different verticals that I mentioned. Um, it, it's now a matter of just increased depth and with the new features uh, coming out with the AR headsets and software, they'll be able to utilize it even more. But that, that was a, a really positive thing that I learned. How does that feel? I mean, that, that it, it always to be validated <laughs> in the yeah. in the sense of of knowing a lot of this stuff and seeing a lot of it, but you got you you took a deeper focus look that just again, like you said, validated a, a lot of what you know. How did that feel to you? Awesome, <laughs> because I've been doing this since 2015, and it was just like I, I I've been using my uh, the logic in my head. It's been guiding me along with, of course, the data that I find. Um, so it, it, it really makes me happy that my bet is actually coming through. Yeah. True. I love that. I love that. I love that. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for spending the time because it was literally like, got an email that you guys had the book for pre-order and I was excited about that. And I said, you know what, I'd love to talk with her, but she's got to have so much other stuff going on right around the time of that book coming out that uh, it's going to be hard. And you, you were, you were uh, gracious enough to, to uh, set some time aside for me. Um, and, and so I want to thank you for joining me and congratulations on that, on that new book. Uh, have you, is that your first book? Uh, yes, it, it actually is my first book in, in this um, area. I've done some academic pursuits before. So mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah, super. I enjoyed working on the book immensely because of all the communications that we had, we had with the people in the industry. Uh, it's really helpful to have these new communications and relationships and I'm going to keep them going forward. Yeah. Well, if people want to learn more about you, your work, uh, the, the book, where would you like them to, to go look? Okay. So um, actually our publishers packed have done a really awesome job in putting up the information on our Amazon book site. So all they have to do is search for the book, um, the infinite retina or uh, under my name or Robert's name to find the book. Um, we're getting a landing page up very shortly, but it's just going to say basically the same thing that the Amazon book page uh, says. So that's where this should go. Yeah. And they can go to yeah. <laughs> uh, infiniteretina.com to check out all the other stuff that you guys are doing because it's not just a book. This is really part of what's driving the work that you're doing. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we didn't talk about that because I'm just doing so many things. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, Robert and I have a company called Infinite Retina that predates actually the title of the book. Uh, Pact said that they want the book to be called The Infinite Retina, which we were really happy about. Um, so our company uh, uh, is a consulting company that helps uh, those companies um, that are interested in spatial understand it better, um, get funding, do strategy, all that kind of stuff. Um, most companies um, from the corporate side don't have a very good understanding of spatial computing yet. The engineers do. And in those verticals that we talked about that are using spatial a lot, like logistics, manufacturing, retail, even healthcare now starting to use it much more. Um, the people that are the engineers and the tinkerers and the makers understand and use the AR but the corporate people in most of the industries are still uh, lagging behind. So we help those people understand how to use spatial computing. Well, uh, I can tell you, you, you know your stuff. And like you said, it's been, it's been validated. Uh, it's been validated through the, through the book. And I think uh, through the interest in that book as well, I think it'll be further validated. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about, about this space. I can't wait. I know Robert's been, um, you know, dusting up a storm for some years around what's going to happen with the Apple device and, how, and, and you've already talked about how that'll have an impact on uh, sort of the, the, the greater industry. Um, but uh, I'm, again, very thankful for you spending the time here and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, congratulations again on the new book. 
Thank you so much, Adam. I hope to catch up with you soon again. You did it. You found the way to my heart. You finished an episode of Marketing in the Raw. Thank you so much for doing so. Uh, You've done that. You've invested the time to listen to an episode. So why not take it to the next level? The next level is subscribing to the podcast. Wait, you're telling me you've already done that? Wow. Then have you rated and reviewed the show wherever it was you subscribed to the podcast? Wait, you did that as well? Holy smokes. Uh, I love, I love, I love that you did all those things. Um, maybe let's see, let's, let's try this one last thing. Did you share the podcast with somebody? Did you send it to him in an email, share it on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter? You did? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of speechless here, uh, but I have to finish the show here. Uh, I appreciate that. I love you so much for doing that. Um, last but not least, if you need anything, go ahead and email me adam at secret sushi.com or just check out what we're doing with the with the agency at secret sushi.com take care wow.